because I remember growing up, I don't remember anybody who was in my position who spoke about voting. You know, how can I get a lot of my teammates and overseas athletes to vote and have an impact and, and care about the same things that they care about that I had no idea that was going on until the last four or five months. Hey everybody, it's Linda Laurel. It has been a minute. I guess you've noticed that uh, I took a little bit of a break after about a little over a year and a half of doing the podcast without a real break, I finally decided it was time. So um, I took some time off. I'm now refreshed and rejuvenated and ready to get back in the saddle because we've got so much to talk about and so many more voices to elevate. And I'm really excited about this, uh, the launch of this, this new season of Our Voices Matter podcast, if you will. Of course, we are just uh, um, 30 some odd days away from the United States presidential election. And um, I don't think there's anything more important that we could talk about right now than the effort to get out the vote. And I'm excited today because we're going to talk about it from a different perspective. And it's from the perspective of professional basketball players who are living and playing ball overseas, expats, and their passion for getting out the vote and making sure that those folks who are American citizens who are living in other parts of the world know everything that they need to know in order to make sure that their votes count. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Let me tell you now who we're gonna be talking with. Uh, Tim Dirksen is a native of Arizona. He played college basketball at University of San Francisco. He's in his fifth professional season and currently playing in the Swiss Basketball League for the Geneva Lions. And, and Tim is the one who kind of pioneered this effort to galvanize American athletes overseas to vote. So we're also going to be talking with Adam Hall, a 19-year veteran who lives and plays in Belgium. Adam uh, went to UVA, University of Virginia, and he hails from Houston suburb called Katy, Texas, right? And also from Katy is Drew Lasker, a graduate of Katy High School and Point Loma Nazarene University. Um, he's a 16-year veteran currently playing for the Newcastle Eagles in the UK. And last but not least, we're joined by Yvonne Harris, whose day job is working in a multinational corporation that specializes in consulting technology and digital transformation. But she's also Drew's business partner in 21 Media, and she's very involved in getting out the vote through ADL and multiple other organizations. So uh, I'm really excited for today's conversation. I hope you enjoy it and don't forget to vote. Well, I am so excited to talk with all of you about the importance of our upcoming election, no matter where you happen to be in the world. If you are an American, it is so incredibly important for you to vote. Um, Tim, I'm going to start with you because I understand that you have been sort of the catalyst for um, galvanizing overseas professional athletes and other Americans abroad to make sure that you exercise your right to vote. So, Tim, tell us how this whole thing got started. Uh, I mean, I just really, you know, wanted to vote and it was kind of becoming difficult. And I saw that there was a question as to if the mail-in ballots were going to actually count in this election. So, I just decided to research and find alternative ways for people to, people to vote. Um, and then I reached out to a couple of friends living out here who directed me towards voteforabroad.com. And then uh, we called to get confirmation from their representatives as to, you know, is this exactly how you're supposed to vote? Uh, and they confirm. So, you know, I just realized, okay, this is a great way for me to vote and you know make sure my voice is heard but then i began to wonder i wonder how many other overseas athletes know about this um so i just posted it and tagged as many ex-teammates teammates friends that i knew who are playing out here um and just kind of tried to get um a poll as to how many people knew about it and not one single person knew that th this was a way that they could vote so statistically i just started looking at things as to you know, how many people aren't voting overseas and, you know, there's 6.5 million voters living abroad and, you know, there just aren't very many of us that are represented. So 
I just started trying to dig, you know, dig into more research, tagging more people and honestly just trying to get as many people as I could to uh, take part in this and, and make sure their voices were heard in, in this coming election. So Drew, tell us how, how you got involved in, in this effort. Um, and it's, it's great to see some fellow Houstonians here with, with, uh, with Drew and, and, um, and Adam both being from Katy um, and Yvonne, of course, Houstonian as well. So, um, so Drew, tell us how you got involved. Well, um, Yvonne and I run a podcast called 21 and we kind of talk about athletes and their journey. And one of my team, one of my former teammates from last year, he, he tagged me on the Instagram post that Tim had started. So um, I messaged him right away and I, I, I wanted to get to the bottom of who actually started this chain and he directed me to Tim. So I asked for Tim's information immediately and I wanted to get him on our podcast so we can kind of talk about this because I felt it was important. Um, for being over here for 16 years, I know that most guys are disconnected from the states and don't really vote. And it's not necessarily that. They and and Drew, well, you know, you're breaking up just a little bit. But, but Drew, hang on one second. Uh, that's okay. You're breaking up just a little bit. But I want to remind people. I want to remind people that you are in the UK, right? And Tim, you're in Switzerland. Yes. And Adam, you're in Belgium, right? Yes, so we're coming, we're, we're like all over the globe, right? And Yvonne is here in Houston with me. So, um, um, so uh, I, what I'd like to do now is to ask um, uh, Adam if I can get him to, to come back and unmute yourself here. I know, and we caught Adam... <laughs> in the middle of, of cooking his meal. So we're just going to roll with it, Adam, while you're doing that. But I wanted to ask you what, what, you know, what are your fellow athletes in Belgium saying about the election and, and, you know, what, what kind of talk are you guys having right now? Well, for me, I've been in Europe and, and playing abroad for almost 20 years. And for me, it's more than just the athletes, it's expats in general. Uh, right. Especially in Belgium, we have a lot of international schools where they bring in uh, American teachers. Uh, a lot of businesses are here in Brussels as the capital of Europe. Also, a lot of military uh, that are expat that lives over here abroad as well. And so it's not just the athletes. Uh, I talked to a few of them recently, and they all tell me the same. The process is very confusing. Mm. It's not very clear because it's based state to state. is different uh, protocols. And this is the problem where every state have their own protocol, some online, some not online. Then you have to go to the embassy by a certain date by a, with a ballot, uh, a mail-in ballot. You have to register. So I remember a few years ago here in Brussels, they had um, a Democrats abroad, uh, a union where you meet together and you do your voting that way. And then they stopped it. So every, every, every year it changes uh, depending on who's in office. Uh, sometimes it's, it's very confusing to a lot of Americans who live abroad especially in the European sector. This, you know, it just boggles my mind because voting should be the easiest thing in the world for us to do. And it just seems to get more and more complicated every year, whether it's here in the States or if it's abroad. Yvonne, I know you're, you're involved in, in the efforts to get out the vote. And, you know, what are, what are your thoughts about this? What are you seeing? I know you're involved with uh, getting... Uh, uh, you're working with the Anti-Defamation League to get out the vote. What, what are your thoughts? Linda, I am so proud of Tim and Drew and Adam and all the American athletes who are really rallying behind um, voting this year. This is one of those election cycles where every vote counts. And whatever the outcome is, it is really going to set a direction for our country that it's going to be very hard to undo, whatever that ends up looking like. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very important to me that um, our American athletes are being reminded of the fact, hey, even though you're overseas, kind of out of sight, out of mind, we need your vote. Whoever you want to vote for, please vote. And there's confusion overseas about voting. And then Linda, there's confusion here in the States too. Texas does things very differently than Arizona, but votefromabroad.org can provide some clarity 
on the process, the deadlines, but you have to engage. It's so important. Yeah. It, it truly is. Tim, what kind of conversations are you having with not only your fellow athletes, but, but also just Americans living abroad about not only voting, but kind of where we are as a country right now? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of conversations and I think that these aren't necessarily conversations that we were having in the past um, that we're having now. And what I'm kind of finding is that this is important to all of us because, you know, for us, it's personal. It's not easy being an overseas athlete when it comes to the everyday lifestyle for a lot of us. Um, Every day for us kind of consists of practices, maybe one game a week and a day off here and there that makes it extremely difficult to kind of have a life outside of just that. And we're all so far removed from our family and the people that we care about. You know, I just think we're always constantly wishing we could have some kind of positive social impact on, you know, all the people we care about and the issues that we're seeing so many of our people go through on a day-to-day basis. So you said that you're, you're having conversations now that you weren't having before. Give me an example. What are you talking about? Um, I mean, when it comes to like voting, I think we're just talking about social justice issues, um, climate change coming from, you know, the U S where that's not really something that's being implemented. Um, I mean, any form of action basically. And we're just talking about, I'm somebody that's just trying to listen. And unfortunately, a lot of these things aren't something that's been, you know, of a high priority or of importance in a lot of times in my life. And, you know, having so are, are you are you talking are you talking about race specifically when you say you're just listening, you're trying to to learn and understand more when you talk about social justice? Are you talking about racial justice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, a lot of my teammates that I have are are um, are black from the United States that are going through a lot of these things and their family are going through a lot of these things. And this isn't something that I ever had to go through. Um and it's, it's different for me. And honestly, the best thing I can do is try to listen and learn and, and read and watch and just try to be supportive. And honestly, it kind of comes back to, to this whole thing is, you know, how can I get a lot of my teammates and overseas athletes to, to vote and have an impact and, and care about the same things that they care about that I had no idea that was going on until the last four or five months. Um, and so this kind of gives us you know, a little bit of a voice and allows me to try to help them in in ways that maybe they can't do while they're living here. Um, You know, not being with their families and in their communities able to actually march and, and protest and, and do things to actually make a difference. This is one way that they can do it from living in a different country. So, you know, these courageous conversations that you're talking about um, conversations about race and, and um, just, how people's lived experience um, is something that, you know, we've not been having these conversations before now in these last six to nine months. Um, Drew, when you talk to your, your fellow athletes, particularly those who are not of color, okay, your, your white um, friends and colleagues, what do you say to them? How do you share with them um, your personal experiences so that they can understand, um, you know, what your lived experience is and why it's important for us to have this very difficult conversation that we're now having globally about race. I think the most important thing is that we're starting to have these conversations. And, and like Tim alluded to, this is something we just never really talked about Um amongst our team, you know, I've been over here for 16 years and we never really had conversations about politics, about race issues. And I think for like my fellow teammates who are not of color, just sharing my experiences and those specifically that are from Great Britain, just because a lot of them are just kind of unaware of it because racism is a little bit different here in Great Britain. It's a little bit more subtle um, it, it, it is evident here, but you have to be more, you got to be looking for it. So as give, opposed a, to the give, us, give us an example of something that you shared with your, your fellow, um, athletes, friends, an, an experience that, that you shared to help them understand what it's like to live in your skin. 
Well, I, I told I told my team uh, this story of in my the area that I live in, which is predominantly white. Um, I during the the lockdown period, I started doing some jogging around my area, and um, I was jogging. I was getting ready to finish my jog. I had a hoodie on over my head because obviously it's a little bit chilly here in the UK. And there were two white gentlemen that were about six feet in front of me when I finished um, because I was probably maybe about 100 yards from my house. And I personally felt the need because it was about 7 p.m. It was getting dark. I had a hood. I had my hoodie on. I had my hood on. I felt the need that I had to speed walk in front of them just so they wouldn't feel uncomfortable. And Hmm. so I shared that with my teammates and they were just they were just taken away that 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 I would even have to, that that would even be on my conscience. And they, and obviously they said right. that, you know, I shouldn't have to live that way, but I just said, unfortunately it's, it's our reality, you know, and I try to go out my way yeah. to make sure that no one feels uncomfortable, but I think that really opened their eyes. And I even put it on Twitter and it opened up a lot of, uh, a lot of people's eyes cause it got a lot of traction, a lot of comments about it, but um, it kind of opened up a lot of people's eyes that, racism is still here and this is the, the stuff yeah. that we have to go through on a day-to-day basis yeah it's it's you know it, it like you say it, it's something that's that's in your conscience it's in your consciousness and it, you have to be aware of it it's like you have to be two and three steps ahead exactly. of whatever a particular situation is to make sure that that you don't put yourself in harm's way or that you know something could come about as a result of you doing something that most people wouldn't even have to think about. So, um, Adam, I would imagine that that you've got some stories. Um, <laughs> is there? T- tell us, tell us something that you know that will help us understand, um, you know, what you have been through as a black man, not only as an American but also a black man living overseas, and particularly, you know, at, at this moment in history with what is going on in the world. Oh, it's funny that history repeats itself Um, for me racism started when i was younger uh growing up in katie as drew would know it's predominantly was a country uh basically white people i think it was like five or ten people in our high school that were black and i dealt with a a lot of racism back then in in high school and junior high school in katie growing up coming from the connecticut new york area moving to texas and my dad worked for exxon mobile and they moved to texas and for me, it was a it was a big change uh, going to a high school where it was basically all white kids, and I was trying to find my way, uh, learning the education system. Because again, like in America, like in Europe, the education system from the East Coast, if you go to a public school to say Texas and Houston and Katy area, is a big difference in edu- education level, and that's still a problem in the states now. What we're talking about now with the government and everything, everything needs to change. Whereas the same level of education I got in Texas. In, in Connecticut area back then, it was for a higher level. So going to sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade into Texas, I was behind. So I had to really hit the books hard and focused on my education and, and develop as I should have developed when I was in the East Coast. So growing up in Texas, it was it was very, very difficult. You know, I was the only child at the time. Um, my mom and dad, and they worked hard, but going to school it was scary for me. I was bullied a lot growing up in Katy. Uh, by a lot of the white kids, of course. Um, I was called a lot of names. I was shot at by, say, the, as they call it, the KKK or the white uh, people over there. It was very difficult uh, growing up there. You were, a lot wait of, a minute. You were shot at as a, yeah, what, as a, it, as a high school it, student? I was, I was maybe, say, 16, maybe 16 years old. And, yeah, me and my cousin were just leaving school, going to the corner store before practice. And then guys pulled up and say, well, nigger, get out of here. And they just started shooting. They took a, a, I guess, a rifle, a hunting gun, and they started shooting at us. And we literally ran to a night shop. He locked the door on us, and we went to a McDonald's. And we ended up going to the police station locally and filed the police reports. And, yeah, this is stuff that I've been through, you know. And that's What year was me. that? What year was that, Adam? When I was 16. This had to be 90, 97, 96. Wow. So for me, that's just one of the things. And, and, and also, is you got to understand the history and, and American history and like growing up as youth, our television programs, we didn't have much black families on TV. So we grew up watching the, the white programs. We had the Cosby show. So growing up, we see white people and like, oh, the beautiful white women. 
uh, unlike today's society. And for me, it, I grew up, I saw white girls. Okay, we're attracted to white girls. So I dated white girls in high school, but again, that did not go well with the public. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I remember mm-hmm. one time I'm driving in Katy and I get pulled over by a cop. I'm, I'm probably 17, 16 now, we have a license and me and my girlfriend's in the car and I'm, we're going to a movie and a cop pulled us over. Uh, basically the cop is like saying, uh, what are you doing uh, with this young lady in the car? And they end up calling her mom and dad, asking her, do you know she's with this guy? And literally they pulled me over just because I was in the car with a white girl. Mm-hmm. So these are a lot mm-hmm. of things that I've been through uh, in, in the USA. And then of course you come to Europe, there's another type of racism. A totally different type of racism. When you're a professional athlete here in Europe or a person of stature or with money, you treat it a lot differently, which I find a little bit odd because I'm an American and I don't see that. I see no color. And I see like, differently in what differently in what sense? What are you saying? For, for for example, in America, they don't they don't really care who you are. You know, if you're black, you're black. You know, like some of the NBA players, NFL players talk about it now, how they've been uh, uh, profiled in the USA because they don't know who they are. If, you play, if you're a basketball player, say, in New York Knicks, but if you go to Denver, they don't know who you are, they treat you like you're a black person. But in Europe, especially in Belgium and other European countries I lived in, if you're an American and you speak to a police officer, they're going to back off you. You understand? Even Meaning, if you're black. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't American, matter. It, yeah, cause I'm because you're an American. They know, they know either I got money or I'm military or some kind of expat and I have power. Oh, interesting. So they're yeah. theater of that. But if my African brothers, same Congo, Cameroon, Nigerian, whatever it may be, and I have many of them over uh-huh. here in Belgium, I hear all those stories and I've seen them myself, whereas our police will try to bully them. They will try to degrade them and they can't do nothing about it. Okay. You understand? Meaning it. It, it's very, it's very saddened to me because I tell everyone that racism started here in Europe, not in America. It started here first. And for me to see my, my black brothers and sisters treated the way they are treated because they don't have status quo or money is sad, you yeah. know, and I fight, I fight yeah. always for them. And, and I, you go out to, to nightclubs or to special places, venues, and they won't let you win because of the color of your skin. They will look at you. They say, you can't come in. I'm like, when my friends like, why not? You just can't come in. That's all they say, yeah. but we know why. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's so, very sad, very sad. Yeah, it, it, it is. And Tim, I would imagine that, that these kinds of conversations have been extremely eye-opening for you and, and very, very difficult. I mean, um, just tell me, you know, when you start, when you hear these kinds of stories, how, how do you then move forward with that? Um, it's, it's really tough because coming from where I came from, where both my parents are both public school teachers and I, you know, was very fortunate and privileged in the lifestyle I lived. It's, it's just very, uh, I, I, for lack of a better word, emotional for me to hear these things. And the first thing that comes to mind is like, what more can I do to help guys like Adam and Drew and, and Lint, like all of you guys mm-hmm. to, to put an end to this. And like, it just never, it's not going to feel like enough, like getting people to vote um, doesn't feel like enough. And a lot of these things kind of make me question how much longer I should be playing. But, you know, I think there are steps that can be taken here in Europe where I don't just have to go back to America and try to, you know, advocate for these things. But I think it's just important for people like me to just continue to listen and, and try to figure out more ways to, to help and ask you guys questions and become more informed and understanding of these things that you guys are going through that just are honestly unbelievable to me. Like listening to his story, I, I cannot believe it. And to be honest with you, I thought we were going to be here talking today just simply about voting and trying to get representation from overseas voters. But, um, uh, it's just, well, and, it's and, really and, and this is this is a part of it. You know, voting is voting is one piece of a very complex, complicated, challenging puzzle yeah. uh, as to how we become better humans right. in support of one another, despite our differences. You know, yeah. we're all part of the same race, and that's the human race. And we have created this 
this, you know, unbelievably um, hurtful, painful legacy of, of caste and color and class and, I mean, division after division after division after division. When do we come together? And how do we come together? And voting is one piece of it. And it's, it's a critical piece of it in the United States right now. It is, it is absolutely critical. And I, I, you know, I think it's fantastic that, that professional athletes and others who have a platform and are in the spotlight and have a, a bigger voice because of, of what they do in that people know who they are and they follow and listen to what they're saying. I think it's wonderful that you are using this platform to bring awareness to the need um, for people to understand what their rights are as far as voting is concerned and what the mechanics are, um, not only here in the States, but abroad. And Drew, when, when you hear Tim you know, talk about the emotion that's involved with all of this and, and, and how you guys have decided to use your platform. You know, what, what are you thinking? What, what is it that you want to come out of what you guys are, are, are trying to do overseas, but also as you are part of this broader American community? Yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing is just um, creating that awareness because speaking for myself, I mean, I was one of those kids who thought that, um, you know, my name's Drew, I'm from Katy, Texas, like, how does my vote matter? You know, and I didn't take advantage of my voting uh, rights until 2008 was the first time, which was eight years after I was legally um, able to. And so I think like people like ourselves, Adam and Tim, who do have a following, who do have, uh, who do inspire the next generation, we understand that there's a lot of young kids that look up to us to make them aware of how important it is and that their voice is important. Because I remember growing up, I don't remember anybody who was in my position who spoke about voting. Um, I, I, you know, I was a huge Michael Jordan fan. And if Michael Jordan would have said vote, I would have voted, you know, just because, you know, really? he, he was, he wow. was my hero, you know, and I don't remember any athletes coming up who said, you know, voting is important and no matter who you well, are. Who you let are, me ask you this, Drew, why, why did you not vote? You said you were eligible to vote. And then for eight years, you did not vote. So what were you thinking? Surely you knew there were elections going on. Why did you choose not to vote? And then what changed your mind? What was the, what was the switch where you finally tuned in and said, okay, I need to take advantage of this right that I have? Just being educated. Um, that's simple as that. When I was able to vote um, in 2000, I was in California going to college and I wasn't thinking about politics or the president or anything like that. And over time, obviously, as you get older, you become more educated and you start to understand that everyone does have a voice and um, and, and and you can't complain about um, how a country is run or who's running or if you want change, if you don't use your voice. And as I've gotten older, I started to understand that. And I wish I would have known this at 2000. That's why I'm taking it up on my duty to make sure that I use my voice to let the, no, the, the new generation know how important that is, even when amongst my team. You know, I'm, we have young guys on our team who are 22, 23 years old, and I made sure that I put in our group chat, I, you know, the information I received from Tim, I put that in the group chat about voting, and there were like four or five guys that were like, Thank you very much. You know, prayer, you know, using the prayer emojis. And mm -hmm. I got the I got the vibe that they weren't even thinking about it until I mentioned it in the group. That's the vibe that I got. So, wow. um, you know, that's what I want to continue to do is just inspire and inform and educate. Um, and, and, and that's my duty. And that's why it's so important to have these conversations. Just, you know, I, I really hope that that all of you will will take this podcast and and you know, blast it out there among your, um, you know, your spheres of influence and all your followers, because the more they hear your voices and they hear what your experiences are, you know, they hear what, you know, what, what you had to say, Adam, and then Tim, they hear the emotion in your voice when you say, I need to, I need to learn more. I need to listen. This and voting is a way for us to have our voices heard. Yvonne, I, I know that this is a, a, a passion of, of yours. You know, when you, 
when you hear these, these, you know, beautiful athletes who care so much about um, our world and, and what they know that it can be, what, what goes through your mind and how do you hope that they can use these platforms to, to help move this, this forward? Yeah, it does give me, um, Linda, to use your word, hope. And um, beyond this podcast, my real concern is that I don't want people to get so connected to social media that they forget to take the action to vote. At some point, you're going to have to stop posting. You're going to have to stop liking and sharing and fill out the ballot or the form or the registration and actually go and do it. And you said it, Linda, um, voting isn't the solution in its entirety, but at least it puts the people in place who can help bring forth the solution. So if you're passionate about race relations, um, if you are bothered by the death, the murder of George Floyd, the murder of Breonna Taylor, here in Texas, the murder of Botham Jean in Dallas, um, vote. Uh, climate change, Tim, you talked about probably doesn't get enough airplay, but here in the States, we are using now Greek letters of the alphabet because we've had so many tropical storms this year. We've run out of letters. Mm -hmm. So there's something going on. Um, if you're um, passionate about affordable health care, um, and want to make sure that you, your parents, your children have health care coverage, even if they have a pre-existing condition, you have to vote. And it's not just the presidential election. The down-ballot voting is so important as well. So even our athletes overseas, when you're talking to your families, talk to them about, you know, what's happening in the national level, but dig deep. What's happening in the state where your friends live, where your families live, and they need to vote down-ballot because a lot of things need to also change locally. And this election is going to determine all of that, Linda. Yeah, it, it's, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's not a, it's not a, a one-shot deal. You know, of course, um, the presidential election gets so much more um, visibility, but there are election cycles that are constantly going on. And, and it's what, you know, Drew, you talked about you know, wanting to inspire and educate and inform. And, and we have to become a more educated populace. We have to take this seriously. I mean, this, you know, the, the country was created of the people, by the people, for the people. You know, we are the people. We are the ones who, who have the, the power to, to, to make the change, but we have to be engaged. Um, and, and Adam, I, I, I know that, that you feel, feel passionately about this as well. What, what's your message? What's your message to, to your followers and, and, and those who um, might even still be on the fence? Although I can't, I don't understand anybody who has a mindset right now that says, oh, I'm not going to vote. I just don't think it's important. What, Adam, give, a, give us your best pitch right now. Why is it important for everybody to vote? Well, until the, the end of election, my, my pitch would be, if you don't know, ask someone that does know, come to me, I will help you. Um, it's, like I said, it's very uh, different and, and, and difficult and also unique at the same time because a lot of people, like Drew said, the first few years, he didn't vote. Why do, why didn't a, lot, why do a lot of Americans abroad don't vote? Because they don't know. They don't know how. They don't know the, the system. Like I said, it's very, it's not as easy as people think as just ABC, you know, it's, it's not as easy. You come to a foreign country, for one, you don't speak the language. You don't know anybody yet. Uh, and it's like, you have to meet people. I think like Drew will tell you, the more people you meet, the more experts you meet, you become educated on, oh, this is how you do things. Even I talked to my military friend just a couple hours ago. They was like, Adam, this, this, this whole process is difficult. It's not as easy as people think. Uh, and this is the struggle I think we have. We have a lot, a lot of expats in Europe in general, all over the world, because that's where the business is at right now. Uh, and like I said, I've been on for a long time and I talk to professional athletes from all sports and they say the same thing. Either they just don't know or they're so busy and occupied with their own job. They just forget, you know, and they just, just say it's like it's like, for example, if you're from the state of Texas, and you say, okay, I'm going to vote, but what, what does it matter, Adam? It's a Republican state. If I'm a Democrat, it's not going to matter. This, this, this is the story I hear often. 
for a lot of uh, voters abroad. And, and like me and Drew, we're dual citizens. We have both passports. And for us, we see how the voting in Europe differ from the voting in America. Whereas if I vote in, Amer in Europe, our vote counts one by one. But in the States, it's by electoral votes, which is a, a big, another big problem as we all talk about how the reform of the government, the reform of the voting system, all that need to change. But again, yeah. How do we get to that? I mean, I hear the NBA players, the NFL players, we all talk about reform, 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 but no one's talking about, okay, a solution to getting to that reform. And this is a problem that we're going to have to talk about and also fix sometime soon or what's going to change in the eyes of many people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I love it. So, Drew, you're on. Give us your best, your best pitch. Talk to those, those voters out there, those would-be voters, um, who might have been like you, who didn't vote for eight years when you were eligible to do so. Give them your best pitch. How do you get them off that seat and in, in, into the voting booth? I would just say the first time that I voted in 2008, it was like there was a sense of pride that I felt um, once I, you know, filled out my ballot that, you know, I never felt um, with anything else. And I think of it like this. Most recently, there was a lot of debate going on about the NBA's uh, MVP award and the NBA's Defensive Player of the Year award. A lot of debate. And we're so caught up in that voting, which that doesn't affect anybody but the people that's involved. But when you think of the, you know, the, the, uh, the voting for the president and all these other local elections, that affects you. So mm -hmm. let's try to shift our focus and really think about the people, our ancestors who paved the way to give us this right. Because for our youth out there, we weren't always able to vote, you know. So, you know, this was something that was fought for, that people died for. And yep. we need to make sure that we take advantage and use our voice. Absolutely. Absolutely. OK, Tim, I know you're passionate about this. Give, give them your best shot. Why should people vote no matter what, no matter how complicated, difficult, whatever. Make them get through it. To piggyback off of everything they just said, we have to leverage our voices. It's our responsibility to honor, just like Drew said, the heroes before us that sacrificed their lives for our ability to vote. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Stanton, Alice Paul, Ida Wells, as well as many other women suffragists here in the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. It's, it's our responsibility to take advantage of that and, and vote. And I mean, an entire life dedicated to giving us all of this incredible freedom to exercise our voices. I just don't think that that's something that should be taken for granted. And I mean, to, you know, talk about something Adam mentioned, I know there's a lot of people that believe that voting is not going to change the system we're living in now but not voting may certainly have that effect in terms of lack of systematic change. I mean, we're, we're obviously here to talk about the importance of voting, but I mean, I think we can all agree that it's going to be more than just voting to, to really make a difference. And things like this podcast, giving me the ability to listen to you guys. Um, I mean, it's important. Things have to change. And just like you mentioned before, this is, this is the number one step. For overseas voters, there's 6.5 million of us. And in the 2016 election, 48% of the overseas voters came from swing states. In the 2000 election, 537 votes determined the election of the president from the year 2000 to 2008. Only 537 votes. So yes, I completely agree with you about lack of representation and distribution among votes between states. But, you know, I, every vote counts and... And just like everyone said, it, it's super important. And hopefully this is the election to, to, really, to really do it for us. Absolutely. And you guys brought it all back to the, you know, those who, who paved the way for us. And, and Yvonne, you know, we as women <laughs> didn't have the right to vote <laughs> uh, for a much longer period of time than our, our male brethren. Um, so bring, bring us home and, 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 and tie this into a nice little bow for us to help people understand the importance of getting out there and casting their ballots no matter where they are. 
Yeah, thank you, Linda. I just, um, this is a call to action. Everyone who is um, of age, the legal age in your state to vote, needs to vote, needs to register. Time is running out. Um, mm -hmm. This isn't um, a period of time where we can kind of slow walk this. Mm -hmm. um, the clock is ticking and um, we need people um, registering to vote, um, taking advantage of early voting, um, oftentimes when you hear about the lines and the waits for voting, that's on actual voting day. Most states have some type of early voting period. Um, Linda, I think Virginia, for yeah. example, is already well, in the voting half, process. Half, oh, half, half of the states, they're about half of the states are in early voting right now. Yeah. Right. You can As vote during lunch. This, yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The length of time it would take you to go grab a cup of coffee, you could mm -hmm. cast your vote. Um, for women in particular right now, with so many women who are impacted by stay-at-home orders, um, online, at-home schooling, it seems like one more thing we have to do. Make the time. Put your child in a learning pod for that one hour that you need to go and cast your vote. But Linda, I'd also like to just shout out these three gentlemen, if I may, who are joining us today. This is the new generation of professional athletes. They are leaders on the court. They are leaders off the court. Both Drew and Adam um, are very active in their communities philanthropically. They're business leaders. I'm so thankful that they are also using their voice to this. And um, I'm going to put this out there, Tim, I felt this the first time I met you and I feel it again. I think you have a career in this type of civic service. It's coming to fore right now. And I think, Linda, we may be talking to a future senator or governor from the state of Arizona. Yeah. Every time I hear him speak, <laughs> I think that. I agree. And, yeah. yeah I, There's I'm something in town. I, I get that vibe, too. I get that yeah. vibe, too, Tim. <laughs> one of the things that I wanted to mention is, number one, like, thank you guys, because it's incredible to me, like, the things that all of you guys have experienced in your own personal lives, but to then be able to come out and, like, speak so eloquently on all of these subjects. Like, I can't imagine how difficult that is. Um, just coming from me, like, as uncomfortable it is to speak in front of like a public audience or speak in front of my team and have these conversations that we're talking about. Like nothing is more amazing to me than listening to you guys talk and tell your stories in such a way that like it, it's something that I know resonates with everyone and it touches everybody. And I mean, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And it means so much to me to hear you guys talk and, and speak on it and, and just, just thank you. I, I really, really appreciate it. Melinda, now, thank I'm you for letting us use your platform this morning. Hey, well, this is, you know, I, I'm the one sitting here now choking back tears because um, hmm, conversations like this um, were my, this was my vision when I started the podcast, was to be able to bring people together to have meaningful, important conversations that remind us of our common humanity. That's it. And, um, you know, to be able to um, create a space where people can be who they are and share their stories and feel valued and heard. And then to have, you know, someone else say, wow, you know, I, I never thought of it that way. Or, you know, I didn't have to go through that. And, and, you know, I want to listen and I want to learn. And, and I mean, that's what it's about. And that's really where, where the change happens. This is where the change happens. And I have to say that um, the three of you give me so much hope for our future. So much hope because we need you. Oh, my God, do we need you. We need you to do what you're doing and to teach and raise your kids to understand that we're all the same. We are all the same. We all want the same thing. We really do. So, right. so proud of you. I'm so proud to know you and to have had this conversation. And um, we will put in our show notes um, all of the links that people need to know if they happen to be abroad. Um, 
to vote. And we're going to continue doing podcasts about the importance of voting between now and Election Day. And we're, of course, going to keep talking about all of the important topics that matter. So I, I'm going to invite you guys back. We're going to have another conversation at some point and see how things are going. And um, please feel free to reach out to me anytime if there's anything that I and Our Voices Matter can do to help you in your, um, in your efforts. We're here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you you so much. Be blessed. So did I tell you that was going to be a great conversation? Oh, man, I I could talk to these folks all day long. Um, I hope that everybody who is overseas will make sure that they take the necessary steps to get their ballots in on time. We've got links in our show notes to all of the different websites for expats who need some information about how to vote, the deadlines and things that are coming up. And you know, it's it's not such a simple process even here in the US because of course each state is different, but the bottom line is people, there's nothing more important right now than making sure that each one of our voices is heard because our voices really do matter. And it really is about the future direction of our country. So please make sure you're registered, double check it, find out where you're gonna vote. If you're gonna vote by mail, do it early. And if you're gonna vote in person, make sure you have everything that you need before you actually head to the polls. Um, Stay engaged with us, please. We're going to be doing a series of shows between now and Election Day about this important topic. And of course, we're going to continue to talk about everything that's going on in our country um, and how we can make this world a better place, one conversation, one person at a time. Thank you so much for watching and for listening, for giving our guests permission to speak and for having the courage to listen with an open mind. We'll see you next time.